What you're looking at is a flat surface and there's some fluid on top of the surface. The fluid flows along the length of the surface in this direction. We're going to assume that the width of the surface in uh, this direction is infinite and we're also going to assume that the height of the fluid above the surface is also infinite. Let's establish a coordinate axis in which x represents the distance from the leading edge of the plate, y represents the distance above the plate, and z represents the distance along the width of the plate. And again, we're going to assume that the width of the plate, or that z coordinate, is infinite. And we're also going to assume that y is infinite above the surface of the plate. If we look at the axes from the side, we've got the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate shown here, where the surface of the plate is shown at a value of y equals zero. Ultimately, what we're trying to figure out is what the velocity profile looks like as a function of x. We know that far away from the plate, the fluid flows with some speed, uh, we'll call it u infinity. We also know that at the surface of the plate, by way of the no-slip boundary condition, the velocity has to be equal to zero. And these represent two boundary conditions for this flow. So u is equal to u infinity at y approaching infinity, and u is equal to zero at the surface of the plate, or at y equals zero. Let's consider a location along the length of the plate that's at, oh, I don't know, uh, 0.2 meters, something like that. We're trying to figure out what u is as a function of y. So if we drew the velocity profile, we know that far away from the plate, u is equal to u infinity, and the flow is uniform far away from the plate. At the surface of the plate, we know that the velocity is equal to zero, and the goal here is to, is to try to connect the dots between y approaching infinity and y equals zero. So drawing the velocity profile, we see that it, it is uniform far away from it, and somehow we, we have to figure out what the velocity profile looks like as we get closer to the surface of the plate. This is what the velocity profile looks like for air going over the surface of the plate. And air has a kinematic viscosity of 1.5 times 10 to the minus fifth meters squared per second. And we're going to assume that the air flows over the surface of the plate at a speed of 0 0.05 meters per second. So far away from the plate, we'll find that the speed here is equal to 0 0.05 meters per second. And this is at y approaching infinity, so far away from the plate. So if we examine the velocity profile at this location, we find again that u is equal to zero at the surface of the plate, and then far away from it, u is some uniform value of 0 0.05 meters per second. Let's start by answering the question, um, is the flow laminar or turbulent over the surface of the plate? What we'll need to do is calculate the Reynolds number, which is equal to rho times u infinity, multiplied by the coordinate position x divided by the dynamic viscosity. We can also write this as u infinity x divided by the kinematic viscosity. Note that the length scale that we're using for the Reynolds number is the coordinate position. And to define that, we're going to say, we're going to use the subscript x for the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is equal to zero at the leading edge of the plate, where x is equal to zero, and the Reynolds number increases as you move down the length of the plate. So for example, the Reynolds number at a distance of 0.2 meters from the leading edge of the plate is twice as big as the Reynolds number at a distance of 0.1 meters from the length of the plate. To determine whether the flow is laminar or turbulent at a given location, we calculate the Reynolds number, and if the Reynolds number is less than 500,000, the flow will be laminar. So here, let's calculate the largest value for the Reynolds number, which is going to occur at the trailing edge of the plate. So in this example, I've got a plate that's 0.5 meters long. And making this calculation, u infinity is 0.05 meters per second. The distance L is 0.5 meters. And we're gonna divide that by the kinematic viscosity for air, which is 1.5 times 10 to the minus fifth meters squared per second. When we make those calculations, we find that the largest value of the Reynolds number is equal to 1,700. And that's quite a bit smaller than 500,000. So we can definitively say that the flow is indeed laminar along the entire length of the plate. The next question we need to answer is where is the shear stress really small and where is it really large? Well, to calculate this, let's look at the shear stress for a Newtonian fluid. It's equal to mu times du dy plus dv dx. So it's mu times the shear rate. 
one thing to consider is that mu is that u, the horizontal component of velocity, is much larger than the vertical component of velocity. Consequently, this term will be negligibly small compared to the first one. So let's just take a look at du dy. Let's take a look at du dy in this region, for example. What we see is a value of u at this location that's very close to u infinity. In fact, it's about equal to 0 0.05 meters per second. The same thing is true if we move up to this location. So from moving from this value, the smaller value of y, to the larger value of y, there was very little difference in the velocity of the fluid itself. So at that location within this region, tau is very small. The shear stress is very small in that region. In contrast, if we move from the surface of the plate to some larger value of y directly above it, we see a very large increase in the velocity. So in this location, we would find that du dy is relatively large, and within here we see a large value for the shear stress. We should also consider the question, where is the speed of the fluid equal to 99% of u infinity? So for example, far away from the plate, u is essentially equal to u infinity at that location. u is equal to zero at the surface of the plate. And the value of u equal to 99% of u infinity would probably be somewhere around this value of y. So let's look at it again. Here u is probably 99% of u infinity. We could draw another dot at this location, another dot at that location. Somewhere further away, we'd probably see u infinity. We would probably find that transition to occur there. And we, we generally connect the dots. What we find is a region in which u is smaller than 99% of u infinity. And up above that region, u is greater than 99% of u infinity. If we look at this more quantitatively, the shaded region in blue represents all locations in which u is less than 99% of u infinity. And it's this region that we're going to call the boundary layer. And not only is the fluid flowing greater than 99% of u infinity outside of the boundary layer, we also see that shear stresses outside of the boundary layer are relatively small. And we'll say shear stresses within the boundary layer are large. Let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. What I've got is a, a simulation now, and let's look at a differential element at that location. If we animate this, what we see is that the fluid translates from left to right, and we're looking at we're going to look just outside of the boundary layer now. At locations outside of the boundary layer, what we see is that the fluid moves in the direction of the vectors at a speed that's equal to something close to u infinity outside of the boundary layer. Within the boundary layer, however, the shear stresses are quite a bit larger. And within the boundary layer, the fluid not only flows, but it's also being deformed. At the surface of the boundary layer, this deformation is begins to look negligibly small. So we see the square translating and it looks just roughly trapezoidal when we after we animate it at the surface of the boundary layer. 